Lorraine Hansberry's Raisin in the Sun, the younger family of five lives in a tiny, dark, infested apartment on Chicago's South Side, sometime between 1945 and the present of 1959. The whole family eagerly awaits a $10,000 life insurance check for the work-related death of Big Walter, Mama's husband and the family's patriarch. Walter Lee Younger, a dissatisfied chauffeur in his mid-30s, wants to invest in a liquor store. In the introduction, he mentions news of another bombing, and he talks finances with his wife, Ruth. Ruth and Benita, Walter's younger sister, both recognize Mama as the one in charge of the insurance money. As the rising action begins, Walter tries to convince her to finance his investment, but Mama's against selling liquor. She wants to support Benita's plan to attend medical school. She's also thinking about buying a house. The family encourages Benita to pursue her wealthy suitor, George Murchison, but Benita finds him shallow. Another suitor, Nigerian classmate Joseph Asagai, helps Benita explore her African heritage. The check arrives, and Ruth reveals she's pregnant with an unplanned child. To Mama's dismay, Ruth has scheduled an abortion. In the climax, Mama uses part of the settlement money to make a down payment on a house. Ruth is at first overjoyed, but then shocked to learn the house is in Clybourne Park, a white neighborhood. Mrs. Johnson, the neighbor, stops by excited for the younger's move, but also scared of the violence they'll likely face from Chicago's white folks. Walter stops going to work, and he drinks. When Mama sees his deterioration, she gives him control over the remainder of the money. She tells him to put some aside for Benita's education and to decide himself what to do with the rest. We see an immediate change in Walter, and Ruth decides to keep her baby. While the youngers excitedly pack, Carl Lindner visits a white representative of the Clybourne Park Welcoming Committee. In the falling action, an uncomfortable but polite Lindner says he wants to start a dialogue. But it's soon clear the neighborhood residents want to buy back the house to prevent integration. Walter, Ruth, and Benita angrily reject the offer and ask Lindner to leave. Soon after, Walter's fellow investor Bobo reports that Willie Harris has skipped town with their investment money, Walter's as well as Benita's share. Enraged, Mama begins to beat Walter. The family, now in need of cash, considers staying in the apartment. An upbeat, hopeful Asagai debates the possibility of progress with Benita. Asagai asks her to move with him to Africa, to work with him to help improve the lives of his people. At his lowest, Walter calls Carl Lindner to accept the buyout. Benita is ready to disown her brother. But Mama insists Walter needs their love now more than ever. In the resolution, Walter instead tells Lindner they plan to move into the house after all. As movers load the truck, Benita says she's thinking about going to Africa. Mama tells Ruth that Walter's finally come into his manhood. With hope, as well as dark uncertainty about integration, the play closes with the youngers vacating their apartment and going to their new house. Let's go over the main characters of Lorraine Hansberry's Raisin in the Sun. Walter. In his mid-30s, Walter Lee is dissatisfied working as a chauffeur for a rich white man. He wants to be treated as the man in charge of the family, and he plans to use his mother's insurance money to invest in liquor. The play is driven in part by the gendered conflict between Walter's ambition and Mama's role as matriarch. Walter Lee is a lean, intense young man, inclined to quick, nervous movements and erratic speech habits. His character embodies the neurotic effects of Langston Hughes's dream deferred. Walter doesn't dry up like a raisin in the sun, but he threatens to explode. His character shows the most significant change, coming into manhood at the end of the play. Mama. In her early 60s, Mama is the beautiful, strong matriarch of the younger family. Mama was widowed before the action of the play takes place, but Big Walter and his legacy are present throughout the play. The whole family waits for the $10,000 life insurance check to arrive in the mail. Ruth and Benita recognize Mama as the one in charge of the money and the family. Mama's role as matriarch conflicts with Walter Lee's expectation of being the man of the house. Mama and her husband fled the racialized violence of the South, 
She says of their migration, we was worried about not being lynched and getting to the North if we could and how to stay alive and still have a pinch of dignity too. Despite the hardship she has experienced, Mama remains an optimist and buys a house to get her family out of their rat trap apartment. Benita, Walter's younger sister, represents a new modern generation of African Americans smart and interested in their racial heritage. She wants to go to medical school to help people, a goal that differentiates her from her brother's plan to open a liquor store. Benita's two suitors, George Murchison and Joseph Asagai, highlight two very separate views of African American identity. At the end of the play, her thoughts of marrying Joseph and moving to Africa effectively get rid of the assimilationist George, crystallizing her character's positive sense of African heritage. Ruth. Ruth is described as being as weary as the apartment. She's not old, but she sags under the weight of a dreary life. Ruth works as a cleaning woman for a white family and also does much of the younger family's housework. She has great respect for Mama Younger, but also keenly feels Walter's need to be in charge. Though defeated and exhausted at the play's beginning, as the play progresses, Ruth reveals her hopes for better circumstances and a closer relationship with Walter. Fearful about having a second child in their economic situation, she puts a down payment on an abortion. Her decision to keep her baby adds a positive narrative arc to the play. Travis. Travis is Walter and Ruth's son, a sturdy, handsome boy. With no space of his own in the family apartment, he sleeps on the old couch. He shows a desire to earn his own money and prove his responsibility by carrying groceries after school. Travis represents the sixth generation of youngers and hope for the future. Let's talk about some of the symbols in Lorraine Hansberry's Raisin in the Sun. The insurance money represents the dream of economic stability, and it also symbolizes the legacy of Big Walter's life of hard work. By putting down a deposit on a house in Clybourne Park, Mama aims to get her family out of the ghetto and create a legacy for Travis. By investing with the untrustworthy Willie, Walter puts this legacy into peril, destroying the stability afforded by the check. Walter's use of the check in this way gives a dark turn to the legacy of the younger men. By play's end, we feel the false promise of the check's possibilities. It's not enough, and the ominous backdrop of racial violence puts into question the viability of Mama's investment. Sunlight and Mama's Plant. The opening stage directions describe the fight for light in the younger living room, stressing from the outset a basic lack of what all organisms need to grow and thrive. Hansberry specifies that the younger apartment has a single little window through which light comes feebly. Raising the question of what can possibly grow and thrive in such dimness, the play's answer comes in part through the strength of Mama and the attention she gives to a feeble little plant growing doggedly in a small pot on the windowsill. Both the family and the plant will escape the play's initial dimness. The sunlight in the new house represents a better environment, not just physically, but emotionally and financially. At the time of the play's early productions, it was a bold, unprecedented move to stage a black actress wearing her hair naturally without straightening it. For the character of Benita Younger, this becomes a powerful symbol of resistance and independence. When she changes her hair, Benita rejects assimilating to white models of beauty and expresses her pride as a black woman. Three types of music in the play represent African-American community, the blues, Nigerian folk songs, and spirituals. The saxophone blues, frequently played on the radio in the younger apartment as they clean and go about their lives, shows the broader African-American culture of Chicago's South Side. The Nigerian folk songs from Asagai celebrate Nigerian communal gatherings and rituals. Along with Benita's robes, this music introduces the rich heritage of African culture. It also creates a temporary unity between Benita and Walter. Spirituals, religious songs sung by the African American community in slavery and passed down through generations, comfort Mama and Ruth. 
the family sings a spiritual in the second act, showing deep bonds despite disagreements. The house in Clyburn Park represents a dream realized for Mama and Ruth, a dream no longer deferred and drying up like a raisin in the sun. The dream symbolized by the house is made precarious by the play's backdrop of racialized violence, and we're left to wonder whether the Youngers will build a legacy of home ownership to pass along to Travis. Lorraine Hansberry's Raisin in the Sun explores several themes specific to African-American experience. Hansberry's three-act play directly engages the segregated housing practices that confined African-Americans to Chicago's black ghetto on the south side, the Black Belt. Each of the play's six scenes take place entirely inside the small, tired, dark space of the Younger's three-room apartment with its cockroaches and shared bathroom down the hall. This enclosed, claustrophobic space keeps the specific reality of Chicago's Black Belt at the forefront of the play. Segregation in Chicago was strictly enforced through restrictive covenants, contractual agreements between property owners, realtors, and banks that prohibited the sale or lease of property to specific groups of people, usually African Americans, Catholics, and Jews. Restricted covenants created Chicago's Black Belt, and Hansberry's play ties psychological health to integration and escape from the poverty of the ghetto. The play references racial violence enough to make us apprehensive about the Younger's plans to move out of the Black Belt into a working-class white neighborhood. Hansberry's play explores the universal experience of economic hardship and also the particularly Black experience of urban segregation and racialized stereotypes. Walter Lee's class aspirations aren't black aspirations. They're shared by many working class Americans who dream of material advancement. At the same time, the setting and context of the play call specific attention to the racism of Chicago's segregated housing. Hansberry's play puts the experience of race on stage for black audiences while inviting white audiences to see themselves in black characters. Big Walter's death provides the money and hope of legacy that set the play in motion, but the younger women recognize Mama as the family's matriarch. The younger women provide a backbone of strength for the family, and they make significant decisions without consulting men. Mama to buy the house, Ruth to keep her baby, Benita to go to Africa. Benita breaks barriers by working toward a career in medicine and by rejecting white standards of beauty. But this matriarchy comes at a cost to Walter Lee's sense of himself as a man. The end of the play suggests Walter Lee's recovery of self, but family legacy remains a question. With the character of Joseph Asagai, Hansberry's play popularizes the concept of a relationship between African Americans and Africa. Both Walter and Benita are drawn to the connection and the stage notes of Act Two, Scene One shift from comedy into majestic dignity. George Murchison mocks this connection, calling Benita's Afro eccentric rather than natural. Through a saga, Benita refines her own identity as well as her image of Africa, and she ends the play thinking seriously about moving there as a doctor to become part of its future. Mm -hmm.